Welcome back to the introduction to particle systems. In this video, we're going to take a quick break away from the creation of particle system effects here in Cascade and talk for a minute about distributions. Now, you've already seen distributions. As a matter of fact, in the last video, every time Zach went into a module and was setting properties, he was doing that up under a particular distribution type. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at lifetime. So here we are inside the lifetime module, and you'll notice up under the lifetime property with the area expanded, we have a distribution type. Now, if we look over to the right-hand side of that, you'll see a blue triangle icon that we can click on, and up under here, there are several different distribution types that can be selected. Now, what exactly is a distribution type? Distribution types are our way of telling this property how we want to represent numbers. And what I mean by that is, okay, let's say with a lifetime, we know that we want every particle to die after five seconds. So every particle will have five as its lifetime. Well, in that particular case, we'd want to use a float constant because everybody has a constant number, and we're going to specify what that constant is. It is not going to change. Period. Now, what if we wanted to say every particle was going to die somewhere between 2 and 8 seconds after it was born? Well, in that particular case, we would want to specify a minimum and a maximum range. So we'd want to come down here and we'd want to set up a float uniform, where uniform basically stands for range. And when dealing with a uniform distribution type, we get a minimum and a maximum parameter that we can type in. So in this particular case, the distribution for this lifetime module is a float uniform and we have a minimum value of one and a maximum value of two which means that the moment each particle is spawned basically a random value between the min and max is assigned for its lifetime That's right so that is what we're dealing with now of course we've got more distribution types you'll notice that we've got float constant, float constant curve. So now we can control stuff over time. And that time could be something like, let's say, the lifetime of a particle. So that we could say that when the particle is first born, that is the start of time. And when the particle is 50% through its lifetime, well, then that's going to be at that 0.5 part. Halfway and along the time. That's right. And when we get to one, the particle's dead. And perhaps we wanted to use that to control something like the size. So that when a particle is born, its size starts off very, very very small, and as it lives, it grows up. It gets bigger, and as it dies, it shrinks back down, so it doesn't actually pop off the screen. It's a very smooth transition. We'd want to do that with a curve, and that is why we have constant curve and we have uniform curve. Now, this can be a little confusing at first, but the good news is we do have a whiteboard lesson planned out. So, Zach, let's go ahead and jump over to the whiteboard because we have more than just the float data type to deal with when working with distributions. We also have a vector type. And vector gets a little bit more involved because now we're dealing with three floats that are grouped together in a XYZ format. That's right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you the various distributions for floats first. Right. And once you get those down, really, if you just take everything you just learned and multiply it by three, you understand <laughs> vectors. Exactly. So just I want you to keep in mind as Zach starts out by writing float down first. And as a reminder, what is a float? It is nothing more than a decimal value. Yeah, something like 3.7192, yep. whatever. That yeah, is any a number float. with a decimal. Now, let me get rid of that. Before we go any further, let's talk for just a second about our graph. Now, this is something that Jason was just uh, mentioning a second ago. We have value, which is going to be the actual value of our property, and we also have time. And time can be representative of different things. In some cases, it can actually truly be time, as in the number of seconds since our particle system has actually begun calculating. In other cases, it might not technically be time as much as it might be the lifespan of the particle. So uh, that's a really bad S. Sorry about that. So it might be lifespan. I'm just giving you an idea that time is going to mean various things while you're working with particles. Now, with that knowledge, let's jump in and take a look at the various distributions we have access to under a float. Now, the very first one is going to be a float constant. I'm going to write this as neatly as I can. And what is a constant? It's a number that doesn't change. By definition, it is constant. So what would it look like on a graph over time? Well, quite simply, it would look something like this. So give that a value of, say, 1.4 over there. 
So if we were to use this with, let's say, life, lifetime, as we've been picking on that module, this means that every single particle that was spawned from the emitter would have a lifetime of 1.4 seconds, meaning that the particle will die 1.4 seconds later. But this is going to give you a very uniform look, hating to use the word uniform here, but <laughs> that is the case because they all live for the exact same length of time. All right, so that takes us to our next distribution type under float, which is going to be a float uniform. And this is something that we'd really want to set for something like a lifetime for a particle system where we can specify a minimum and maximum range. That's right. Whenever you hear the word uniform, you need to be thinking the word range. Always remember that. It'll keep you from getting confused. And in a, uh, a float uniform situation, we would have a min value, which we could say is represented by this line we already have here. And then we could also have a max value. And let's give this a value of, say, 5.7. And the number that we get, our resultant number, is going to come from somewhere within this range in between these two lines. That's right. So the first born. particle gets born, it could be 2.8. The second particle that gets born could be 5.3. That's right. So on and so forth. No particle will have a lifetime, if we were using this to control lifetime, that would be less than 1.4 or greater than 5.7 seconds. That's right. So really, all you're doing is you're just grabbing some random number from within that range, and that's what you have to keep in mind. Okay, so let's erase all that out and clear off our little graph, and that takes us to our next distribution type. Right. So far, you'll notice Zach just drew straight lines. So basically, the values did not change with both constant and uniform over time. But what if we did want something to change over time? And as we said a second ago, time could be the lifetime of a particle. So let's say we wanted the color to go from black to bright over the particle's life. Well, this is where we'd come in and we'd start using curves. Now, when using curves, you've got to ask yourself, are you working with a value that's looking for a single input, or are you looking for a value that needs to have some sort of range between a minimum and a maximum value. So starting out here with a constant, even though Zach is going to draw a curve for you, the value that's going to be returned to that property will literally be a value that is sampled from this curve at the given time. That's right. It's a value that's in flux. As time progresses, it's going to be sampled from the curve. Like if, for instance, in this case, time was representative of a particle's lifespan, and by the way, while Zach writes that down, let me just throw this out there. You'll notice Zach likes to jump back and forth. He uses lifespan. Sometimes he'll use lifetime. While it's lifetime, lifespan is very common in 3D applications. Yeah, I, I so, come from 3D, so you'll so hear me yeah, jump back and, and forth. And that's fine. I want you guys to realize anytime you hear lifespan, it is the exact same thing as lifetime, and we will use these words interchangeably. So let's say, of course, the beginning of our graph is going to be uh, So that's birth, birth and then death at the end. And then, yeah, he, he's dead. And so halfway along our life, like say right about here, we have a specific float value that we would fire out. So for example, if this was a value of 1.4 like we were using earlier, and this was a value of say 3, then right about here maybe 2.7. Yeah. So, so 2.7 is what gets pulled out. The key thing to understand is the value found on the curve is the value that will be handed to that property because there is no minimum and maximum range to pull from. That's right. All right, now before I even move away from this curve, before I move away from curves in general, I have to br actually break away. I know like this whole lesson is a branch out, mm -hmm. but there's something else I want to bring up before we go too much further, and that is the concept of lookup tables. Okay. Now, lookup tables are a way that internally Unreal will simplify a curve. Because think about it. Calculating a value along each section of a curve is a complex thing. I mean, that's what we have calculus for. It's a very uh, complex thing. It can uh, wear down on system resources. So internally, what Unreal Unreal will do is take major samples at regular intervals along the curve, and it'll save that out in a table so that during gameplay, so it doesn't get slowed down by uh, having to go in here and calculate the true value at that given time. That's right. It's just uh, calculating a linear line playing connect the dots in between each point. So it's just a way to save on calculations. Now that takes us back over to Unreal for just a moment, where if I get out of Cascade, we have a button up in the toolbar which says select to make distributions use the curve and not the baked lookup tables. So if you're ever having a problem with your final effect and uh, you notice it just doesn't look like the way you think it should, you can turn this on and see if the problem is that those lookup tables are kind of oversimplifying things a little bit. I just wanted to bring that up. Okay, so that's a quick look at float constant curves. I'm going to jump back over to my eraser. Actually, should I erase this whole thing? No, I would leave that one there. All right.
And now things are about to get a little bit more interesting because what Zach's going to write down next is going to be a float uniform curve. And this is where we now have an X, Y, and a Z value. But these values are being pulled from a minimum to maximum range and they're being represented as curves now. So now we're going to have three different minimum curves for X, Y, and Z, and three maximum curves for this, X, Y, and Z. So this is just a float. Oh, we're still on a float. I'm getting ahead of myself. Isn't that great when we do that? <laughs> that is. So fortunately, we're going to keep this a little bit simpler for just a few more minutes, then we'll get into vectors. All right, that's a nice curve. There we go. That'll work. So again, minimum, maximum. We'll keep the range simple. That's right. So we just end up with some number being calculated from within these two curves. That's right. At every single calculation of the game. That's all there is to it. So again, from in this case, as Zach has written here, lifespan, from birth, a random value is picked between minimum and maximum and used to drive whatever it is we've assigned it to drive. And then as the particle progresses through its life, different values are randomly selected each time between the minimum and maximum set on this curve. And if you think about that, using this for something like size can be problematic because you could say at the birth you have a size right here. But then it's going to get calculated again. So just one more calculation into the lifespan, and now it's up here. <laughs> and then the next moment of calculation, maybe it's down here, and then it's down here. So what happens to your particle? Over just like a fraction of a second, it goes between three very different sizes. So you get a flickering effect. Right. So watch out for the, the types of properties you would apply this type of distribution to. Okay, that leads us to our fifth and final distribution available for floats. Which is a really special kind of distribution. It's what happens if you're looking for control from outside of Cascade, such as from Matinee or from Kismet. And this is where we have our float particle parameter. Parameter. <laughs> It's okay, that T is not that important. That's, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking at one screen and writing on another. So we have the float particle parameter. It's a place where we can simply take in some sort of input, such as from Kismet or Matinee or even from Unreal Script, and fire it directly into our, uh, our distribution value. And that's something that I'll talk about actually when we get done talking about all the other distributions, because it warrants a little bit of special discussion. That's right. Now, as I am so excited about distributions and I'm trying to get ahead of the game by talking about vectors, here we are. We're now switching gears to vectors. And there are all sorts of parameter types where vectors are going to be important. Think right. about colors, RGB, size, XYZ. There's a bunch of different ones. Initial We're, position. Initial position. There's a bunch of different things that are going to be looking for an XYZ type of data to be handing off to that property. All right, now what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to clean off my, my little graph up here. So I guess we could leave the lifespan, but I'm not going to. I'm feeling very eraser happy today. Okay. All right, so let's get back in and start jotting down what we have. Okay, so just like what we have for floats, we have the same types of distributions for vectors. So the very first one we have access to is a vector constant. And, and it's very important to understand that in the distribution type, you're not going to see vector if vector is not something that would work on it. If you jump back over real quick, Zach. Oh, yeah. To, you, you're, yeah, let's go back into the lifetime module real quick. I already know where so you're going. So there you go. So take a look at this. Where is Vector at? Well, how are we going to represent a lifetime in 3D space, if right. you will, you with can't. an XYZ value? You can't. So Vector's not in there. But if I go to initial size and try to assign a new one, we get a Vector. All Vector types, because for size, we're looking for an XYZ value, not a float value. Now, why is that important to you? Well, basically, it means that you don't have to worry about choosing in between these because Unreal's going to do it for you. That's right. What you need to decide is what type of distribution you're going to use, uh, whether it be along the float or along the vectors, which we're going over now. So a vector do, constant... Do undo. That squiggly over there is just going to drive me. There you go. Oh, I feel so much Make better. sure it goes away. <laughs> All right. So what does a vector constant look like on a graph? Well, you're going to have some value for X. It's going to be a nice straight line. That's right. You're going to have some value for Y. Nice straight line. And you're going to have some value for Z which is also a nice straight line. So and we're no longer sampling a long time here. There's no need to. Basically, we have a constant value. Now, oh, just real quick. This yeah, might go without saying. This might sound fairly obvious, but these don't necessarily, of course, have to be in, this, in the X, Y, Z order. They could be in any order. They could all be right on top of one oh, another. yeah, exactly. Just making sure you understand that. That's right. X, Y, and Z could all be a value of one. That's right. And the funny thing is, by doing that, 
Oh, never mind. I, I, we'll wait yeah, just yeah. a second. I'm going to get ahead of myself yep. once again. I already know where you're going. All <laughs> right, so let's go down to our next vector distribution type, and that is going to be a vector uniform. That's right. So now we're working with an XYZ data type, a vector, and we're looking for a range so that we can randomize things. That's right. In fact, it's m mostly just a float uniform times three. That's right. Like three float uniforms. That's really all it is. You can use what you've got there as a starting point. So uh, hang on a second. Put some I, I sort of can. Let me make these letters a little smaller. <laughs> Okay, I got gotcha. you. So we'll have, um, let's see, X, min, uh, this will be Y, min, and we'll make this one Z, min. Okay. And so what I'll do is I'll put in, ooh, let's, let's mix it up a little bit, shall we? So this will be our X max. And this, right, I'm, I'm going to squeeze it in. We've got our Y max. Okay. Which will be right here. And then we have our Z max which will be up here. Now, what does this mean as far as your ranges are concerned? Well, that means for calculating x, you're going to get some number that falls within this range. Randomly selected. That's right. Randomly selected on every calculation. So remember that. For y, it means you're going to get something from this range all the way down the line. I'm not going to scribble that all the way down, but you get the idea. And then for z, we get something from this range. Like okay. so. So that's a quick look at vector uniform. Again, it's just three ranges, one for X, one for Y, one for Z. Now let me go ahead and just take just a second, and I'll clean off my graph again. And we'll talk about our next distribution type. This is where things are going to get really interesting. I'd like to point out also that from time to time you will see vector uniform being selected, but the values that they've got in place really are a vector constant, such as the min-max values are 25, 25. Well, what are you going to find between 25 and 25? Nothing. Nothing. It's, it's just 25. So as a matter of fact, in the last video, Zach, I do believe you may have switched one of was, your distribution types over. I think it was initial size. Okay. So everything came in at 25. That's right. Which is not really a, uh, a uniform value. Well, there was no range specified. Yeah, the result won't be a uniform It was value. locked down to a constant type, so Zach changed it over to a vector constant. And there's a, really the biggest reason I do that is just to keep things straight in my head. So let's go over to uh, vector constant curve. Constant curve. And this is just like the float constant curve, except once again we're dealing with an x, a y, and a z float value. So we have an, a curve specified just for x, we could have a curve specified. I'm going to mix it up again. We have a curve for y. And I'm just illustrating that these guys can cross over one another. They oh, do go not, there you go. They do not have to be separated. And so here's z, and it just... There we go. So we have three separate curves being calculated for each of the three axes. That's right. So once again, when dealing with time, and it could be the lifetime of a particle, we're going to pull our value from these curves. It's not going to be randomly generated between a min and a max. It's going to be from these curves. In fact, thinking about it, I think it's always going to boil down to either being the emitter time or the particle's time, which is going to be its lifespan. That's correct. All right, so let's go ahead. I don't think I have to erase that. I think we can use that as the basis for our next distribution, which is going to be, and this is where it gets really fun, we get the vector uniform curve. And what we have here are six total curves specifying a min and max for x, a min and a max for y, and a min and a max for z, and we're choosing a random number from a range in between each of the two curves. So here we have, uh, let's say this becomes min x, this is going to become min z, and this will become min y. Let's now create, uh, if you guys will just ignore the value, I have to write right on it, so we'll do max x and we'll start here, and let's see, just see where it ends, because I don't want the x's to cross over one another. Let's connect that there. Uh, let's see, for min z, let's do, or max y. Here we go, max y. And we'll start here, and we'll end, say, here. So, oh, yeah, it's getting really nice and complicated now. And then for z, we have, let's, let's start it right in here. So we'll start here, and then we're going to end way up here in the corner. Freaky, isn't it? Okay. So uh, now what are we going to get for each value? We'll take a look at the numbers. For x, we're going to get something that falls within this range. Notice we have max x and we have min x. So you've got to kind of scribble in between the two curves. 
and we get a shape that looks something like this. So it's going to be a random range selected from in between these two curves on every calculation. For y, we're going to get something within these two curves all the way down the line as I get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what it's, it's actually what it's showing is that that range is going to increase over time. And then finally for Z, we're going to end up with some number in between these curves all the way down the line. Perfect. So there you go. And that's just that's an overlook of how vector uniform curve works. It's going to look a little frightening over in the curve editor, but there's really nothing to it. Again, just keep in mind that it's just like three float uniform curves. Okay, and then the final type that we have available is going to be the vector particle parameter. Once again, giving us external control from places like Matinee or Kismet. That's right. Now, as I said earlier, parameters are kind of a special case, and they warrant a little bit of special discussion. So let's break away from what we've done so far uh, with all of our curves and whatnot. I'm just going to clean all of this off, and let's just take a look at uh, specifically our parameters. Now, for our purposes, the two main places you're going to receive values for a parameter are going to be from either Matinee or from Kismet. And we'll actually demonstrate both of those uh, in this video series so you can see how they work. But the reason I, that I want to kind of talk about parameters, because it's almost enough to say, well, you're getting values from some external source, such as Matinee and Kismet, and just leave it at that. But it's cooler than that, because you have the ability to map values and change a number as it comes in from these external sources. And here's what I mean. Let's say that the number we're getting from, uh, oops, as I, I'm sorry, I flew away, never mind that. Yeah, you got to be careful with the shift when you're real low like that. Yeah, so there we go. We have a, a number coming in from matinee, say, between, I don't know, 500 at the high end and maybe just uh, 1 at the low end. So this is going to be some value, and maybe that's a distance the player is from a given effect. Okay. Now, when it comes into... Uh, cascade, we might need that to be mapped between 0 and 1. And we can specify the ranges here as an input range coming in from our external source and an output range. And let's take a quick look back over in cascade so that everybody knows exactly where we're talking about this. So let's change our distribution type. So we'll take our lifetime and we'll set it to a float particle parameter. And there we go with a min input and a max input and then a min output and a max output. That's right. So the input values are what's going to come in from your external source, again, such as Matinee or Kismet. The output values are what you're going to map into. This would actually be the true lifetime based on the number that came in. So, for example, if you're expecting some number from Kismet between, say, uh, I don't know, let's, let's get a little funny here, maybe 300 and 500, then you could map that between 1 and 2 seconds. So if you had a number like 400, that would come in at 1.5. That's right. And then, of course, you can also come down here to the constant number, and you can set the default value for this. So if I set this maybe to 1.5, then that's going to be my, uh, my default output value. Okay. So that's a quick look at uh, our parameters. Again, I just wanted to drive home that you can map values using those inputs and outputs. And that's an overview of all of the distributions available to you inside of Cascade. And I think that's going to wrap things up for this video.